Today, Climate Finance Day here at COP28. Senior figures in the world of finance have really been calling for better data around emissions and, of course, the viability of green projects in order to unlock more investment. Well, I'm very pleased to be joined by Philip Hildebrand, who's the vice chair of BlackRock. Philip, thank you for joining us. I mean, good we always morning, talk, of course. Good afternoon, I good guess. Afternoon, <laughs> right, sure. Good morning for our London users, because they're the ones that tune in the most. When you look at some of uh, the climate initiatives here, I know there's a lot of questions about, you know, the phasing out of fossil fuel. There's a lot of questions on carbon markets and carbon credits. But then we have the loss and damage fund. So are you optimistic that, you know, we're day four and we've already achieved something? I think we've achieved something. I mean, this is like a, a huge Greek play with lots of different actors. So it's hard to tell, you know, where it concludes or when it concludes. We're about halfway through. Uh, I think there are some positive elements. To me, the most important one, perhaps, is we're beginning to see actual private capital formation uh, designed to go into the emerging world uh, in order to invest in the in the climate transition. I think that's, you know, to me, when you look at the overall challenge, if we can't solve for that, then we won't make it. So th this is the key piece of it. And, and now we've moved from just talking about it, recognizing it as a problem, to early stages, early signs of capital formation out of the private sector to be mobilized for the transition. But then we need to put it somewhere. So yeah, the capital formation, so like how hard is it to find the right projects? Exactly. At speed. Exactly. So I think that, you know, first was recognizing it as the main problem. Now, various announcements um, from the hosts, from Singapore, from many other places, we were involved in it. You're beginning to see private capital being kind of created, formation of private capital. Now comes the big questions, where are the products? How do we make sure it goes into the right projects, into the weakest regions, in a sense, in this? And, and that's going to be, the, to me, that is the, the, the key message coming out of here. If we can't solve for this, we're not going to tackle this, uh, this existential problem of climate change. But, Phil, how much of a chance is there that we do have some kind of comprehensive carbon markets, right, um, even language, that holds together in the next couple of weeks? Uh, I think that's difficult. To me, you know, I was thinking in the car over here, what's, what's kind of one of my future takeaways? And the carbon market is something we have to kind of wrestle with, I think the community as a whole. Uh, that's, in a sense, the next stage. That has to be part of it as well. So we have all these elements. We have reduction of emissions, new technology, carbon markets, um, you know, air capture. Many people don't like this, but that is going to be clearly part of it. The involvement of industry. This was the first time that really you had heavy industry, including oil and gas, that was part of this COP. Those are positive signs. But I think at, at the moment, I want to kind of emphasize just the importance of getting capital to the emerging world. And, and here I'm beginning to see some progress. We need the projects, as you said. And that's, by the way, where, where the MDB reforms, MDB discussions are going to be very important. The World Bank needs to think of itself not as a competing agent to the private sector, but as an enabling agent. Same with the other MDBs. And, and there's some progress there, particularly at the regional level, that gives me some hope. And it feels certainly like the new president of the World Bank has really put this at the forefront of what he wants to achieve, right? Identifying some of these projects. The problem is that Indonesia is very different from Vietnam. It has also local regulations. So do you think that we'll be able to manage the transition or, or at least the readaptation in time? I hope so. I mean, what I'm a little worried about is that, you know, that there's a lot of focus on the really big problem, changing the capital structure of the World Bank. From my experience in the, in the public sector, that's going to be really hard. So I would encourage him, and he's done a great job, you know, in the first few months, encourage him to look at the things that you can really change, the mindset of the institution, getting out of the, not competing with the private sector, but enabling, empowering the private sector, making the projects. They are closer, the MDBs are closer to the projects in many cases in the private sector. Make those projects available now that we're beginning to see some formation of private capital. Uh, so, you know, I would, I would think it's important to, to think of the, the reform of the World Bank, not just at the level of the capital structure and the, the stakeholders, but also at how do you change the internal kind of workings of the World Bank in that regard. So how complex is this in a world that's ever-changing, where we're seeing huge rallies and then bets on a Fed rate cut, which could be imminent? I mean, the world is volatile, the world is evolving, so where does climate change financing come into this? This is very hard. Hard things are hard. You, you look at these uh, kind of newspaper articles that talk about you know, how little progress we've made, but we've had a pandemic. We have a war in the middle of Europe. We have another war you know, in, in this region. 
So this is, this is really hard to do all this to ensure that it's fair and just, that we have growth. Industry has to be part of this. I don't see how you do it any other way. So this discussion, by definition, is difficult, it's hard, and we have to just chip away at it day by day and, and make progress where we can. Again, to me, the core is we have, we have got to mobilize private capital for the emerging world to fund this transition. If you look at the need, I mean, we need about a 15 to 24 times increase, let's say a 20-fold increase in the investment flows into the emerging world. That's not going to be funded by the public sector. The private sector has to step in. Private capital has to be mobilized. And I think, to me, that's, you know, at least the first few days, there's a hopeful message coming out of this. I mean, I guess maybe it was difficult as interest rates kept on going up. Do you think we've reached peak rates? Well, I, I think we're probably close to it. What we're going to struggle with now is we have a lot of production constraints globally. The, the geopolitics are fragmented. Demographics are putting constraints on it, which means, in my mind, that it's going to be harder for central banks. They're going to have bigger. They're going to face more difficult trade-offs between output and inflation. So we'll probably have more volatile, more volatility in markets. We'll have less trending markets. Beta will be less of a force. So the macro environment, I would say, is going to be in a sense, more challenging than what we've seen during the great moderation. And in all of that, you know, lower trend growth, higher volatility, higher interest rates, uh, that's going to make this, this climate fight more difficult. There's no question about it in my mind. But lower trend growth, not, not a recession. Yeah, I don't think that's so important in a sense. You know, the, the ch it looks like we can avoid a recession. Uh, but I think now that, w that we've mostly normalized the post-pandemic distortions, inflation has come way down, it's still coming down, uh, interest rates hopefully have peaked. But, you know, the next challenge is now how do we operate in a world that is constrained on the production side globally, which leads to, I think, bigger trade-offs for central banks, more difficult trade-offs, probably lower trend growth and higher interest rates, and at the margin, stickier inflation. That's going to make uh, the policy challenge more difficult. Do you think the Fed will, I mean, the market is definitely pricing in Fed cuts maybe earlier than the Fed governors are, are you know, they're kind of pushing back against the markets quite a lot. Like, how, they've been pushing back for the last six months. Every six months there's like a fear in the market, they, they get kind of talked off a ledge, it's fine, and then after six months there's always this fear. Yeah, this like, is a, a lot of this in my mind, I would be skeptical on, on the sort of rapid, uh, you know, rate cut story. Mostly because I think a lot of people in the market are still thinking in terms of the old world. So we're going to, you know, get into weak growth, therefore central banks can cut. My message would be, you know, we need to be prepared for a different type of overall macro environment. Global production constraints, more difficult trade-offs for central banks, less ability to respond to weakness by immediately cutting interest rates, higher rates on average, lower growth. So we need to think of not a return to the old business cycle model, but kind of a a new world that is shaped by these production constraints. Now, if we can resolve them, if we can resolve the wars, if we can, you know, make progress on the transition, that will help to expand the production capacity of the global economy. That's the key objective, in a way, for, if you look at it in a, in a broad policy sense. But Phil, so what does that look like? And also, I was looking at, the, you know, figures of onshoring and investment in the U.S. I mean, they've gone through the roof. I mean, you yeah, literally have a chart absolutely. that was flat and then... It's just taken it's, off. It's, uh, think of it as a rewiring of the global economy that, you know, on balance leads to higher costs, which leads to more production constraints, which leads to, you know, higher inflation on average, lower growth. And so this is a more, I would say, a more challenging world. It doesn't mean there are no opportunities. Investors are going to find great opportunities in this, but we're going to see less trending markets, more volatility, and for the policy world, more difficult trade-offs, which is why it's not as simple as to say, oh, growth is weakening, therefore central banks will be able to cut rates rapidly. I think that's, a, uh, that's too, too much anchored in the previous world. We're now in a new regime, uh, which is a different one. And so I think you know, that's what we need to kind of wrestle with, this, this new environment. Yeah, you have these competing forces. Philip, as always, thanks so much for joining us. That was Philip Hildebrand there, the vice chairman of BlackRock.